Good afternoon. I'm Shannon Durejo from Crema Media. Welcome to today's webinar on South Africa's energy outlook, where a panel of experts will unpack what to expect regarding ESCOM's restructuring, new generation investment, grid expansion, and strategies for local content. Today's webinar is brought to you, brought to you by EY Parthenon, MDA Attorneys, Nordex, Actum, SunGrow, and Engie. We thank them for their support in making this webinar possible. Before we get started, please be aware that we've enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A box. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. The panelists will answer as many of your questions as possible throughout the discussion. To encourage interaction, we've also enabled the chat function, so you can network with the panelists via the chat box. You'll also find this at the bottom of your screen. Please remember not to post any questions in the chat box, though, as we may miss them. Post those into the Q&A instead. Please be aware we are recording this webinar and we'll send the recording to you when it's available. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Paul O'Flaherty from EY Parthenon. Prior to joining EY Parthenon, he held several CFO and CEO roles in listed companies, as well as in the public sector and family-owned businesses where he's played a key role in successful turnarounds, mergers and acquisitions, and project management. Paul has industry experience in mining, infrastructure, energy, manufacturing, trading, steel and financial services, and has worked in South Africa, across Africa, as well as in the Middle East. Paul will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which includes James Mackay, CEO of the Energy Council of South Africa, Vaughan Hutting, Director at MDA Attorneys, Bernard Magoro, Head of the IPP Office, Compton Saunders, MD of Nordex, and Mamiki Matlawa, Group Business Development Executive at Actum. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Paul O'Flaherty, to continue with the proceedings. Over to you, Paul. Yeah, thank you, uh, Shannon, and good afternoon, everybody, and a uh, special welcome to, to the panelists. This, this topic is, is really broad. Um, and you know, when we talk about ESKIM restructuring, the, the recent changes to the, to, the, to the grid connections, the South Africa's Just Energy Transition Plan, so many topics uh, to unpack. Um, but what we thought we'd do is, is maybe focus a little bit on, on three key areas uh, and, and debate those areas. The one which is top of mind uh, late last year, uh, you would have seen the uh, latest or the draft integrated resource plan of 23, which came out uh, for public comment uh, to replace uh, the IRP of 2019. That's definitely worth a debate, big swings in, in some of the allocations. Uh, the second part is, is, is grid constraints. Uh, you know, evacuating a power is, is a big issue in South Africa and, and, and actually, you know, particularly around the, the transmission lines. And thirdly, enablement, and, and particularly for the private sector. So, so we'll unpack some of those issues uh, and you know, touch on, on some of the other issues uh, that Shannon spoke about. So if, let me start with the IRP. So if you look at the, the integrated resource plan, the draft one for 2023, significant uh, changes in mix here. A, a big focus on security of supply and estimates that over the four, next four years, uh, we will still have elements of load shedding. For the first time, it's gone into a two horizon, so uh, an allocation of what's required by 2030, but then a, a window thereafter. Um, and uh, obviously a big change in the mix of, of allocations, uh, particularly longer life uh, for the, the coal power stations, far less emphasis uh, on wind, in fact, significant drop in that, and, and we'll talk about it but a big uptake in, in, in better generation or, or distributed generation, which, which is self-generation. So perhaps let me start off with, with James. Uh, you know, James has, has over 20 years of experience in public and private sector, significant experience in the energy sector, and, and as Shannon said, current CEO of the Energy Council. So James, you know, off, off the bat, your impression of RP23 and, and an indication that for the next four years, you know, we'll still have, have load shedding. Do you think it's good enough? Do you think uh, there's more we can do? Thanks, Paul. Um, and good afternoon to all the, the listeners online. Uh, maybe two very important questions, and we might have to make a little bit of separation between them. Um, I think we can come back and chat about the IRP. I, I see some 
real positives that we can build on from our P23. Certainly, as you've said, Horizon One has brought better shorter term focus. I think that there's emphasis on the interventions around taking action. So certainly like um, accelerating gas um, and some of those, the TDP, uh, those are all important. Um, I also think that there is a, what we've seen is a very different response out of government over 2023. And, and the business government partnership has, has sort of really emphasized that. And the IRP 23 has uh, sort of made a firm commitment to engage with, with uh, business and in general with society around what is the pathway of the future um, for our energy sector. Uh, so certainly there are things which I think can be corrected and updated, maybe not corrected. Um, but there's a lot of in areas where maybe old data has been used, those need to be improved, uh, old TDP, old GCCA, some old CapEx numbers. But I think we've got to maybe, you know, get into the, use the opportunity to engage on the IRP. And I think we, there's a lot that we can take from it. Um, but the IRP paints really essentially a very, very conservative outlook uh, of an energy sector. But I don't think the data is necessarily wrong. Um, and that then emphasizes the fact that we've got to engage on it. Um, I think that the, the probably the more important question on top of mind, Paul, is actually load shedding. Um, I think that there's a huge amount of work that went into, again, the business government partnership, the energy action plan, uh, NECOM last year, in setting that foundation to really focus on how do we get more clarity understanding around uh, ending load shedding, which is being framed under the president's meetings. Um, and he has those in-person meetings with business ministers and CEOs on a six-weekly basis. And I think that's really giving a lot more confidence as to where we will move with load shedding. Um, we can come back to the details, but I think that uh, at the moment, there's been a significant the tail end of last year, a lot of uh, scenario planning and detailed modeling around the critical areas being what will happen to EAF, uh, what will happen to new generation over now 24 going into 25, and then some of the key enablers and, and sort of uh, important directional shifts which we see in the reform. Um, I think that the the output of that work and the engagements at the moment, there's three days of energy action labs going on at Eskom. Um, I was there most of this morning, is I think that there's a, a more confident view that if we take a two-year view, we can end load shedding. So in 2024, we have enough uh, new generation coming online if we look at rooftop utility, solar uh, and wind, uh, the standard offer out of Eskom is contracted just over a gig of new power, imports uh, also a gig of power. And if we can just stabilize EAF uh, in 2024, essentially that will get us to uh, sort of stage one of load shedding by the end of 2024. Then 2025, we've got to focus on recovering reserve margin, improving reliability, and really getting that energy security back into the system. So there will be some kind of big communications coming out, I think, jointly out of government and business, but there is a positive outlook. I think from a societal perspective, we can say we can end load shedding effectively by the end of this year, but really bearing in mind that there are risks, there's a lot of work to be done, um, and then we've got to build on top of that the, the reliability and the reserve margin that the system needs in 2025. So I think that that's my view, um, but happy to dive into the details a little bit later. Thanks. No, thanks, James. Um, that, 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 that's 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 uh, very positive. I think uh, from from some of the meetings you you've been having at, at Eskom. Perhaps uh, Vaughan, the, the the next one for you, uh, Vaughan, who's the director of MDA Attorneys, a significant uh, commercial uh, experience, um, particularly in the energy sector. Vaughan, you know, one one of the big highlights in this integrated resource plan is is the self generation and connecting to the grid. Um, so distributed generation. And, uh, you know, one of the issues uh, that, that, that is an issue, and, and maybe you can unpack it for us, is, is that all generators who, who wish to be grid tied and have an installed capacity over one megawatt require a specific guarantee. So over, over and above construction work guarantees, et cetera, for what you, you, you build, there's a specific uh, potential liability. Perhaps you can unpack that a little bit for us, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, good afternoon, everyone, panelists and participants. Um, yes, Paul, it's, um, there are a couple of issues that that, uh, that come to the fore when one looks at these guarantees that 
are necessary to for for um, we'll just call them generators to provide in order to secure grid connection. And I think besides the the, the mechanics of the guarantee itself, um, one also has to look at and consider, especially in in you know I think in light of one of James's comments earlier, um, that the IRP twenty three encourages a strong commitment to engage. And and I, I, I agree with him. And having you know, looked at the red and considered the RP23, I think that that's, that's a fundamentally important shift and, and focus. But one of the things for me and I, as, a, as an attorney that, that this goes hand in hand with is engagement with contractors and engagement in this instance with, um, with generators, particularly for them to tie into the grid. And the form of the guarantee that's required by um, by by Eskom, uh, which, as you mentioned, is hand goes hand in hand and runs in tandem to a large extent with any contract works guarantee, is this grid capacity allocation guarantee, both of which are on demand guarantees, and I think that for me also informs the approach um, generally that ESCOM takes to its contracting and engagement, at least on a contractual level with contractors. The on-demand guarantee is a, um, it's a, it's a typical instrument for, to secure performance by contractors generally. But, um, and I don't think in this instance, it, it goes beyond the, what is typically understood, but it raises the question of whether or not and to what extent this onerous type of guarantee um, is, is indeed necessary. And in my experience with contracting and contractors generally, this form of guarantee, it's, as I say, it's onerous, um, but, but at the same time informs a more, a wider, um, and a wider motive, um, a wider point and um, philosophy, it, it exposes that philosophy towards contracting generally, and that is towards and, you know, a, a, an adversarial form of contracting, an adversarial engagement with contractor and generators in this instance. And that, I think, is something that needs to be addressed throughout, and not only in, in the context of guarantees, but generally in um, the contracting forms and the contract requirements, particularly in this instance with the, the self-build type arrangements that um, generators are expected to to sign, so I think that that um, in you know that that needs to be addressed you know in a broader context. It's a difficult question, um, and is a is is a has been debated for in many forums in, in many employer organisations. But I do think that um, with with a strong focus on engaging and commitment to engage. I think that that is one of the areas that needs to be looked at, particularly by um, by both Eskom and its contractors and generators. And I think looking and taking a different view, um, perhaps on the adversarial forms of contracting and types of guarantees that we encounter, may also go some of the way to assisting in that engagement and making it more productive. Yeah, thanks, 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 Vaughan. And, and we'll come back to that that particular issue. And there are some uh, questions in the chat there. My next one is is for Compton, uh, as Shannon said, MD of Nordics Energy. But um, Compton also has board roles in the South African Wind Energy Association, and he chairs the Manufacturing and Local Content uh, Working Group uh, in the Wind Energy Association. Um, Compton, when I when I unpacked uh, twenty. Uh, the previous RP 2018 versus 2019 versus uh, this current one in draft. And I look at the wind uh, allocations to 2030, uh, you know, from uh, around uh, 11 and a half thousand in the 2018 RP to 17,800 in, in the 2019 and now 8,000 megawatts only from, from wind. What, what, what would you say, um, Compton, are the biggest challenges for the uptake of wind power, and and why why do you think the, the, these allocations have, have have been revised quite quite dramatically? I think, in in my view. Um, thanks, Paul, and uh, afternoon to to everybody. Um, yeah, look, I think um, 
Yeah, look, I, I think the first question is, does wind remain um, you know, quite a key part of the energy mix, which um, I think is in, indeed indeed the case, right? So um, from, a, from a generation profile perspective, um, the, the, the profile of wind is very well suited to complement um, that of, of, of solar. Um, so it, it has to remain uh, quite a key, um, uh, key generation technology. Um, and therefore, um, from an uptake perspective, I think um, we've historically seen as part of the, the REAP, it's um, you know, been uh, the dominant uh, uh, renewables technology. Um, and I think we continue to see a similar trend uh, in the private uh, in the private market. Um, so I think from a, a, a change in 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 the, the considerations in the REAP, I think there's obviously a number of factors which uh, are contributing to that. Um, I think obviously one of the the major constraints generally is just the volume of of new generation that 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 could be brought online. Um, I think obviously one of the major factors uh, remains the, the grid constraint. Um, and um, yeah, and I think, um, I think uh, you know, again, just considering that uh, there's been uh, some adjustment in, in other technologies in the IRP um, and considering all of the, the various factors, um, um, you know, there's been a scaling of, 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 of wind to, to accommodate. But I think regardless of that, if we again just come back to um, you know outside of the IRP, um, where I think in the in the private space we've seen significant volumes of, of wind procurement continue um, over the last um, over the last couple of months. Um, so um, we've seen the private market uh, develop and um, you know either closing or tending to close quite large volumes of, of, of wind. Um, so we'll, we'll be seeing some of the biggest wind farms coming online in the country, um, you know, over the next two years. Um, so, yeah, so completely confident it will remain uh, a, a dominant, uh, dominant technology. Thank you. Thanks, Compton. Um, Next question, uh, I'm going to switch over to, to Bernard. Uh, the, the last two panelists uh, are Eskim alumni like myself, um, but uh, <laughs> let me talk to, to Bernard, uh, head of the IPP office, really, really important uh, job, uh, more than uh, 20 years experience in, in the energy sectors. Perhaps, and, and as uh, Compton points out, Bernard, um, you know, IPPs and renewable IPPs in particular still remain a significant part of the mix, even though some of the allocations potentially have changed. Uh, in your experience, uh, in, in what you've seen in the IPP office, uh, what are the, some of the key contracting challenges for IPP projects, particularly coming forward? And, and how can these be navigated? And what are the lessons learned from the rollout of, of the previous IPPs that are in place? Hi, Bernard. Apologies, yeah. I... I... I was still muted. No problem. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Paul, and good afternoon to you and uh, the um, audience that joined us this this afternoon. Um, thanks, thanks for inviting us, and thanks for the question. And I think that's the real challenge that we're facing as a country. Um, the 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 bottlenecks that we have seen in the last three years. Um, one perhaps must acknowledge that I mean what we have seen. Uh, in the last two or three years is nothing short of disruptions in South Africa, you know, starting with COVID. Uh, then we had a reform that had to be fast tracked because of the energy crisis that we had. Um, the demand globally for, for the same products that we're looking for has also skyrocketed. So it's not just a South African issue. Uh, this is what everyone is experiencing all over the world. Just to give you an example, in the UK, they ran a a tender process for five gigawatt of show wind. Nobody submitted the bid. So I know we are always hard at ourselves that we are not closing projects, but it's not just a South African phenomenon. But be that as it may, we do have a challenge. And, and I think if I can just categorize these challenges into three uh, pockets, I think the first one is the grid. Um, and the grid is it's not just the capacity issue, it's also the the allocation process that we we you know, we had a, a system in the past that worked very well, 
but with the reform that happened with the Schedule II um, relaxation, uh, the model has to be adjusted to, to, to be able to accommodate these, these uh, markets that are developing in parallel. So that one, at least, uh, ESCOM has reached a landing. We, we, we now have a clear direction in the form of IGA. We also have the gating approach that the regulator is uh, currently evaluating. So hopefully that, that risk of connection will go away. But the second one, and I think that's the big one, is the, uh, the transmission capacity. We've got gigawatts and gigawatts of projects in the Cape region that cannot collect, connect because there is no transmission capacity. So we heard yesterday that the Minister of Electricity is going to set up the transmission um, IPP office equivalent. And, and I think that's a step in the right direction as well so that we can get more capacity to connect. But um, I think we, we must also acknowledge from last week's bidders conferences that we hosted, um, everyone kept talking about, or rather we received a lot of questions around uh, what government is doing to unlock the different permits authorizations uh, and licenses. And I think that's the one area that um, I'm glad to hear um, James talking about the work that's happening between government and, and the business. And I think NACOM has also made um, lots of stride in this area with the establishment of the one-stop shop. So if we can get that right, I mean, it still takes 90 days to get a generation license from NASA, up to two years to get an EA. Uh, given where we are now, I think we need to really uh, um, do something about the one-stop shop and make sure that it's implemented immediately. On our side, uh, we also had some lessons as well. Um, and and you'll, you'll see in bid window seven that there has been improvement in, in the, the drafting of the RFP to, to, to also make sure that the projects close and those that don't close and then it's clear in terms of the, the, the process going forward. We now for the first time have reserve bids process where those projects that fail to close within a prescribed timelines, then we'll get other projects to step in and close. Uh, so those are some of the things that we are we are also implementing on our side to make sure that we, we can close these projects and get this much needed capacity as soon as possible. Thanks, Thank Paul. You. Yep. Thank you, Bernard. Um, my next question for Mamiki, uh, who is the group, group Business Development Executive at Actom. As I said, uh, Jessica alumni also um, has worked for the Industrial Development Corporation. Mamiki, with, with the private sector hat on um, and with, with these allocations um, of future generation required, uh, particularly in the, in the IPPs, but as well as the, the transmission grid uh, and the extensive amount of money that needs to be spent there, how, how do you think at Actum that uh, localization can best be promoted and, and what are the areas specifically where you think we can we can grow local uh, content uh, faster and, and quicker uh, thanks paul and thanks to good afternoon to everyone and the list uh, the, the listeners um i think what we need to continue doing is to continue with the work that was done by the dtic when the the work around local designation of specific equipment and i think that work why we should continue to do that the importance of that is that it it, it forced manufacturers like ourselves to not only look at how do we localize whatever equipment that you're building but also bring up the value chain uh, locally. So it would not just be you know, manufacturing jobs specific to that particular equipment, but the downstream of that particular uh, industry. So that's one way of uh, promoting it, but also um, ensuring uh, that uh, in areas where the, we, we do not have uh, capacity in a sense is that um, the powers that be instead of um, opening up to the rest of the market, but insisting that the, when the rest of the market come to take up these opportunities, there is partnering and transferring of technology so that we continue to, to industrialize as, as we have seen what the, the, IR, the draft IRP is talking about. So that, that needs to happen. And, and I think the, the you know in in a sense of where we are in terms of capacity in locally we south africa can do balance of plant in renewable energy you know without you know without a doubt and i think we we, we need to continue to 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 
to be on that trajectory to, in terms of um, utilizing equipment locally for, 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 the, for the new projects that are coming. Well, thank you, Namiki, and, and we'll come back to, to, to some more questions to unpack there. I, I want to switch uh, uh, the discussion to, you know, uh, all of you have mentioned it uh, in some form, the, the grid uh, and, and the constraints around the grid and, and the management of the grid. Um, and, and we know through the ESKIM uh, restructuring that the, the transmission company uh, is being unbundled as we speak. But perhaps uh, for you, James, the first one is, is really do you think that there are adequate wheeling and trading frameworks uh, being developed that can work between ESKIM, um, local government and private participants? What are your views on that? Oh, thanks, Paul. Um, if you'd allow me, I think it's important maybe just to um, give some reframing for the average listener, because we often, you know, as specialists, we get very much involved in all these very technical conversations behind closed doors. Um, and are often not very good at communicating. Um, so <clears throat> I think it's important to just reference the structure of NECOM. Um, it's got these technical work streams. It's been established you know, to deliver against the energy crisis under the Presidential Energy Action Plan. And a lot of people, as lay people, I think here, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's lack of confidence. There's a lot of distrust in these type of messages. They're not fact-based. And 2023, I think, really challenged that uh, in terms of the business government engagement relationship and the lead that Business for South Africa and BUSA took on that um, in being able to say that we can't live here as a country and as an energy sector, we've got to be able to do more. I think the president was extremely bold in welcoming business to directly engage and partner with government. And that's really strengthened and, and government have been very sort of responsive and engaging in that uh, so, so I, I think we've, we must be careful of not to just dismiss the past and the, the lack of confidence in, in these statements. Um, we must acknowledge that. But then we do need to take a leap of faith and say, well, we've got to move forward and what is happening at the moment. And then we can ask the question around the confidence in those actions. So I think you know, the, the answer to sort of the wheeling market codes, the NTCSA development um, the ERA amendment bill, all of these are very important reform signals, either from a policy perspective, I think there's firm commitment that the ERA is still gonna be going through in the sixth sitting of parliament. That will be a very important message to business that we are pushing with reform, we are open for private sector investment and, and sector sort of shifting. The NTCSA board has been a, a sort of appointed a very strong mix of skills and private sector people on there who are going to take their mandates and and responsibilities very seriously, and I think drive that out. We've seen, a, a fin, I think, a fantastic choice of new CEO for Eskom, who's going to come in and I think really help stabilize and provide better leadership. I mean, all of these are the sort of the, the directional strong signals that we're moving in the right direction. Underneath that, um, certainly within NECOM, uh, there are well-progressed uh, efforts around national wheeling, um, net metering, uh, feed-in tariffs, or some of the other new, new market codes, all of those are being developed. Um, the one-stop shop, I think, is really progressing, um, is making an impact and a difference. So, so, you know, I think we've got to get better about being able to communicate when will these start hitting the market? How will they uh, be implemented? Who is accountable? And, and what is the impact for the average sort of user and consumer of energy? Um, that I think we've got to be a lot better at, but you know, in short, I think a lot is being done that is going in the right direction. And there is a, a, a really a much greater degree of accountability and reporting within the NECOM structure. Um, every two weeks, those uh, all of these action items get reported into the NAT joints, also business participates. So there's better scrutiny. So I think we've got to, you know, we can't unpack it all in a, in a session like this. Um, but, you know, I, I think that there are definitely signals and clear signs that we really are starting to move in the right direction. Um, well, maybe if I could just chat quickly about GRID. Um, one of the things, you know, GRID is a critical part of uh, the sort of shift in the, in the transition. I think it's an international message and signal as well. In the context of, of where we're at at the moment, um, if we look and again, the IRP, I think, can be updated because it used previous TDP numbers, previous GCCA numbers. So 
Essentially, it used a view that there was no more grid capacity available in the capes and hence lower wind. It also used a sort of a, a softer or lower TDP kind of target. Um, if we currently take, I think the BQ sort of allocation and applications that I have it out of ESKIM is about 16 gigawatts. Um, curtailment, I think, will go ahead. I think there's a lot of progress that should be announced. That's another four gigawatts in the capes. Um, and if we see last year, we put uh, rooftop PV between residential CNI two and a half gigs um, from September 22 to September 23. If one just looks at that, um, which aligns exactly with the ESKIM assessment of ready projects that can be delivered in the next three years, they came out at 20.6 gigawatts. Um, those numbers align that we can industry and I think organizations, you know, like Nordics and Actum, we must push hard because we can invest and build 26 gigawatts of wind and solar in the next three years. And by 2030, if we can make sure that we are confident in the delivery of the TDP, that will bring another 32.6 gigawatts of capacity available by 2030. So in theory, we can go through this transition. Um, we've got to make sure that we are resourcing those programs, holding them to account and delivering the timelines. I would like to raise a point though to, to Bernard as well is, and I think this is also an important point in the IRP. If we are going to start accelerating that type of rooftop two and a half gigs a year, and that type of utility and private sector investment, we have to catch up on gas to power and best uh, battery storage. And I think these, uh, I was very pleased to see that emphasis come through both in the RRP as well as in the IPP office. So I think that there are other things in an integrated systems view that we've got to think a little bit more carefully about than just only what are the gigawatts available on the grid, because I think that those bottlenecks are closer than sometimes what uh, people realize. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks, James. Um... So I'm going to move uh, to, to a couple of questions, Compton, for you that, uh, you know, there, there's a couple of questions around the wind and, and touching a little bit on what James said. And uh, it's really uh, some of some of the people watching this uh, saying, what is the true uh, potential for wind? Um, you know, th there's quotes here of 25 gigawatts to 60 gigawatts. Um, you know, in your view and, and, and for the work that you do, what, what do you believe the true potential is uh, for South Africa and wind energy? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, that's quite a challenging question to answer. And um, I don't think I'll, <laughs> I'll offer a, a, a particular view, but I mean, I think um, there's various studies, I think that's been done over the last couple of years, uh, you know, from indicating 80 gigawatts of wind capacity. I think we've seen the, um, the, the, the last renewable energy grid survey that was done, uh, you know, again, indicating, um, you know, large uh, volumes of wind that's uh, available um, for, for, for closing over the next, uh, over the next couple of years. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, 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 it's not a clear answer at this stage. Um, however, I think um, uh, just coming coming back to to some of the I think your previous question and also comments that uh, Bernard made was um, you know there's quite a large volume of of projects uh, sitting in the Cape regions that are you know high maturity uh, high maturity projects. I don't want to call all of them shovel ready, but close to shovel ready. Um, that is unable to, uh, you know, to to reach for financial close due to uh, the inability to evacuate um, from the grid. And I think, unfortunately, um, you know, although we've got significant uh, grid capacity in other areas, um, such as Mpumalanga, Free State, uh, Kuzuru Natal, if you look at the, uh, the latest uh, GCCA, um, you know, the challenge remains that those have not been high priority development areas um, uh, due to, I think, you know, numerous reasons. It, you know, doesn't always have the best wind resource. Uh, there's, uh, you know, more environmental challenges. There's uh, mining operation challenges. Um, and, uh, you know, developing a wind farm takes anything, you know, from three to 10 years to, you know, from starting to, to actually being able to reach uh, financial close. Um, so yeah, so I think the challenge with the, the existing grid constraints um, and and uh, developers having to move into these new areas, um, the reality is that it will take a, a couple of years before 
uh, you know, those projects actually reach uh, uh, maturity um, and, and is able to, uh, you know, to reach financial close and, and deliver power to, to the grid. Um, from a technology perspective, uh, you know, I think the technology already exists uh, in the market to, uh, to, to manage lower wind resource areas. Um, so from a, a wind, wind turbine technology perspective, um, you know, there's, there's no real limitation or, or constraint. Uh, it's simply simply a, a matter of of timing, and uh, yeah, I think the ability of these projects to uh, to to reach the right level of maturity. So yeah, so unfortunately, many projects that are that are mature in the capes that are are stranded, uh, and it will take um, you know a couple of years for the non constrained non constrained uh, grid areas to to fully develop those projects to maturity. Yeah, thanks, Compton. No, that's yeah. I think that balance is is important. Um, Mamiki, maybe next for you, um, from an Actum perspective, we, we've spoken about the grid, we've spoken about uh, the activity that need, needs to take place. But when you look at it, Actum specifically and, and your production capacity, um, are, are you expanding in the areas of transmission and distribution products and transformers, etc.? Is is that part of the strategy of Actum? in South Africa? Um, Paul, yes, currently, um, so we, we, we currently have two divisions that we are looking, that are currently supplying, especially to the GDP. For instance, our high voltage division, currently, or at least since the RIP 2011 has supplied uh, equipment to about 80 to 90% of all the grid tied projects. So that particular division is currently uh, doing an exercise as there's look when 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 we look at the TDP, the upcoming TDP and all the IPP that are still have to be connected to the grid, we believe that there's an opportunity for about 40% uh, increase in capacity. Um, and uh, on the distribution transformers from our side, we we have excess capacity. So there isn't a need for, 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 for expansion in that space. And on the step-up transformers, we also are meeting current demand, um, except in higher classes of transformers where we actually not participating at the moment. But uh, we, we do believe that there's opportunity to partner with uh, international partners to, to at least uh, look at local assembly. So, Yes, uh, it's a mix of, uh, you know, different products that go into the, the next infrastructure projects that some have, you know, there's a real need for expansion and whereas in some others, there is excess capacity. Thanks, Maniki. Um, Vaughan, just sticking with this, um, uh, you know, issues around the grid and, and the, there is this concept of the interim grid capacity allocation rules. Uh, that that each uh, IPP needs to be cognizant of. Um, perhaps you you know it's fairly technical. Perhaps you can unpack it for us and and what the challenges uh, around that are. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, the the introduction. Well, as we know, the introduction of the interim grid capacity allocation rules um, goes back several well, uh, lengthy period, and there have been some I think significant developments, particularly um, following the June 2023 um, enactment, I'll call it, of these rules. Um, the rules then, as, as we know, they've developed to a point, and I think the starting point um, change in philosophy from a first come, first serve to um, the move from the first come, first serve to a first ready, first served principle which um, I think ensures that there will be, or that's envisaged to be, a, a loosening of the bottleneck through, um, in, you know, through the application of that principle. The rules themselves, um, I think, then are informed largely by, um, by that shift in philosophy. And we saw in November 2023 um, an engagement that has resulted in several amendments to these rules, and as it currently stands, um, I, uh, in, 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 in my, to the best of my knowledge, the rules are in the in the finalization or concretization process um, as we speak. 
So I think there's going to be a, um, a significant um, unbottling of, um, of the, 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 the availability um, of, of shovel-ready projects getting into the grid, obviously subject to constraints within the grid itself. The rules themselves um, are, as I say, the, the amendments to rules themselves, there are a couple of significant points that um, haven't changed. And I'm going to go through these the evaluation criteria, particularly um, for um, um, that 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 we have now um, introduced through the new amendments. And these, as I say, haven't changed. I don't believe in hugely in um, in form and substance, but I think um, are, are are definitely clarified to a greater extent. The need for environmental consents. And all environmental consents and necessary authorizations, particularly in respect of water use licenses, in respect of that gener the generation facility, still needs to, to be in place. The requirements to have the water use license um, available and in hand, as well as the Civil, Civil Aviation Authority approvals, these have been relaxed with IPPs, who now only require to demonstrate that they have applied for these licenses. Power purchase agreement, heads of terms, these need to be duly signed with end users um, of the power or licensed energy trader and confirmation from the off taker that um, the appointments are in place. The, there's also been um, the requirements surrounding land use permission for construction of projects has also been relaxed. And although IPPs are required to own or have a lease with the landowner in place prior to ESCOM issuing a budget quote, the RPPs will no longer be disqualified from securing that um, connection budget quote if permission to subdivide land for non-agricultural use has not yet been secured. And that, I think, is a significant move in the direction of unbottling what were before and what still remain um, onerous requirements but necessary requirements. Then the um, the requirements for IPPs to show two years of measured data for wind farm sites and one year for solar has also been relaxed. And that again is significant in that the IPPs are now only required to show one year of measured data for wind and provide satellite data for solar PV projects, provided of course that um, this data is obtained from a reputable source. Then in terms of the, um, we we started off, Paul, you asked me about the grid, the um, guarantees. The applicants are still required to furnish ESCOM with a grid capacity allocation guarantee. And these are, um, this guarantee is to be issued by a financial institution approved by ESCOM immediately following confirmation of the project that the project meets all other criteria. There are still negotiations and amendments are, um, are still under negotiation. Um, in respect to the guarantee, and I'd like to come back to this guarantee because we have a, a significant um, overlap of guarantees in terms of the construction works projects and the self-build, particularly in the event of self-build agreements and the, the, the grid capacity allocation guarantee. And <clears throat> I think that the requirements um, of the guarantees are, um, are, are, are typical, and I'm sure that the majority of um, IPPs would be familiar with these guarantees. So in as much as the rules do um, are, and I think to, in a significant, to a significant degree, are relaxed, the requirements that this gar these guarantees be submitted I think are going to be fixed. And I don't believe that that's an encumbrance. Um, but as I said at the outset, I do think this informs particularly two other issues in my view that um, go more to the nuts and bolts of, um, of, of, of realizing this, um, the grid connections of realizing this increase in, in supply generation, and indeed even in trans transmissions. The nuts and bolts I'm talking to uh, are besides the available capacity. So, for example, in the transmission sector, as as um, in terms of local capacity, there are very few local contractors with the capacity any longer 
to construct the, the transmission lines that we're going to require, which is itself a huge constraint and uh, I think a, a significant um, challenge. But more on a nuts and bolts level in terms of the, the, the contracting um, necessity that that these that this type of on-demand, the philosophy that informs the, the, require, the need for an on-demand guarantee, in my experience, I think is also to a degree a constraint that we've got to address. And that is not only in terms of the contracting strategies that apply and we, I'm there talking in broadly broadly to the adversarial strategies that I believe are um, currently the, um, the, the the traditional way of um, of ESCO engaging the IPPs and um, its other contractors. And also, in my experience with these contracts, is the implementation, the practical implementation of their terms. And I think, together with what we what we're seeing in the bigger picture, I think that significant attention should also be focused on these, these issues. Um, a contract is a contract, and it's really only as good as the implementers. And also the strategy that informs both the implementation and the terms of the contract. And as I say, in my experience, I think that this also um, is a challenge. I don't think that you know the rules aren't intended to address that type of challenge, but do require that the, um, the contracts and the the necessary um, engagements that have to happen to create those contracts are in place and the contract themselves largely dictated to and the terms are largely dictated but i do think that as part of the challenge to increase availability and generation capacity and i think more so when we get to if constructing transmission lines i think also attention needs to be given and paid to both the contracting strategies and the processes and yeah. application of for implementation. Yeah, thank, thanks, Vaughan. And yeah, I mean, partnering and partnering in construction, uh, I think that's where we got ahead. Um, but perhaps, Bernard, uh, fr from the IPP office point of view, um, you know, sounds like, you know, from all the other panelists, lot, lots of opportunity from a, a generation perspective, uh, shovel ready or close to shovel ready but but the grid scarcity remains remains a key issue here um from an ipp office point of view how, how do you view that um and particularly as you roll out the the program and and are dealing with these uh grid scarcity issues yeah well i think this is the the number one challenge and i think it's important to put this pro problem into perspective uh, from the 19.9 gigawatt that the last uh, gcca indicated it's available um obviously cape is zero we're sitting with zero um the about six gigawatt of that it's sitting in uh, northwest free state and limpopo and those are the provinces where we have seen projects in the past. The other 13 gigawatt is in provinces where we have not seen projects because those are low yield areas. Um, that's Gauteng, Mpumalanga, and, um, and uh, KZN. So we, we do have a serious challenge. Um, obviously, the message to, to developers is that uh, they need to start moving in those areas to develop the projects. Um, we understand that there are projects that are already uh, near ready in, in some of those provinces, but uh, we must also understand this will come at a premium for, for the buyers. Um, in, based on our previous uh, bid windows, we have seen up to 30% difference in the tariffs between the Cape region and um, areas such as in Malanga. But yeah, for now, that's what we have. We have to develop projects where the grid is available. Uh, I'm just highlighting that, you know, we are moving into that uh, situation where we will start seeing um, the impact on, on the overall tariff because of the grid uh, not being available. So our number one focus as a country should be to expedite grid development. Um, if, if one has to think about load shedding the, uh, at stage four or stage six, um, if we are considering renewables to solve this, uh, it means you have to 
multiply that number by three to solve each stage of load shedding. So we need, if one consider the worst case scenario of stage six, we need about 36 gigawatt uh, of, of capacity to, to solve that. Um, and to make sure we have enough excess capacity for maintenance and the like. And grid, as we said earlier, we can only get 19.9 uh, .9 gigawatts. That means we have to expedite grid development. But to answer your question, for projects that are aiming to, to, to participate, they have to start looking at provinces outside um, the Cape area. But I think the, it's important to also mention what has happened in the last year. That is the curtailment um, work that ESCOM you know, has been um, facilitating in the last year. And I understand the studies have been done. So that four gigawatt, the sooner it gets released to the market, uh, the better so that we can at least get some of those projects that are ready in the um, Cape region to participate in the programs. But yeah, certainly grid remains a concern for us. Yeah. And uh, we are also working with ESCOM to make sure we can expedite that process. And ha and have influence on the TDP uh, where, where you can, I assume. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks, Bernard. So, so you know, we've spoken uh, a lot about constraints, um, challenges, but, but let's talk about, you know, what, what we really need to do as South Africans, and that's execution uh, and enablement, and particular in South Africa. So, so you know, I'll go through uh, the panelists uh, back to Francia Mamiki um, from an Actum perspective and, uh, you know, private sector, very active in this space, skills uh, and the capacity locally to, to assist in the generation, the transmission and the distribution systems. What's your view as Actum and, 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 and what, what do you see needs to be done and is being done to, to increase our capacity? in South Africa? Uh, thanks, Paul, for that question. Um, I think our view as ECTOM is that we're looking at skills in, in, in relation to sustainability of the manufacturing sector. So what we're currently doing at this moment, we're investing about 50 million rand in an artisan training center um, where we're focusing on electrical, mechanical, and boiler making and welding. And I, I believe uh, those of us who remember the times of Mirupi and Kusile will remember the, the welding uh, skills availability drama that happened, especially in Mirupi. So we, we continue to, 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 to invest in that. Um, and I, I think another thing that maybe we, I think has been under the radar that uh, I think meaning as a collective, we need to start is, uh, looking at that. And I, I remember that um, Bennett would correct me if I'm wrong, that with the IPPs, one of the requirements is for them to set up a community trust. And I think my, my belief is that those community trusts were also used to train people within a certain vicinity of power plants that are being built. And I think we, we need to continue to, I mean, this program has been in the running from 2011. So we need to, try to collectively look at where those skills are and reactivate that process. Because when you look at, we, we're hoping that the, the draft IRP uh, indicates that um, for, for once industry will start looking at consistency. And I think this the private sector has been crying that um, with the stop start that we've seen in the IPP, we we looking we we want to invest we want to and that that means also investing in skills but we we hoping that going forward we will we'll probably have almost as a smoothened demand profile that are, that will allow for consistent investment in skills and and capacity. Thanks, Mamiki. I, I remember the well situation, Madidi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you were probably still at this one then. <laughs> so, um, Compton, to you as well. You know, lot, lot spoken about wind, Eastern Cape, you know, Western Cape. But from a solutioning point of view, and and from a positivity point of view, you know, how how are you looking at it? And 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 you know, what what more can be done? Certainly through the private sector uh, to to really make this plan happen. Yeah. Thanks. Um... Yeah, I mean, um, I think we have to be thinking in the context of 
you know, large volumes of procurement. We remain at low levels of procurement, but I don't think there are such significant challenges. We can continue as is, but it's really, I think, in the context where we've got a significant uptake in renewables, um, where uh, I think it introduces, uh, you know, quite a number of, of, of challenges and opportunities which we which we need to be managing, right? So um, I think just from a skills perspective, um, you know, uh, I think just from the experience over the last, uh, you know, 12 months in the market where, you know, there's been some movement uh, with, you know, projects reaching financial close, construction starting, um, we are really seeing quite, quite, uh, you know, uh, significant challenges in, in finding people that's available uh, you know, I think to participate in the various, um, you know, stages of, of developing, closing and constructing, uh, constructing uh, projects, um, especially from a, you know, Nordic's perspective as a, as a, as an EPC, uh, surely in, um, you know, the availability of construction professionals, we see, uh, you know, quite a significant challenge uh, in finding people in South Africa with uh, the requisite experience um, and qualification. Um, I think there was obviously, you know, this this long hiatus we had between but window three and four. Uh, you know, we lost a lot of skills to the international market. Um, we continue to see, uh, you know, us losing skills to the international market. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if we if we get to the, you know, multi gigawatts of wind and solar being developed and procured on an annual basis, um, we'll certainly see challenges. I think, you know, whether it's lawyers, engineers. Uh, you know, uh, business development professionals, uh, you know, construction professionals. Um, th this is going to be a challenge, which I think, you know, as a as a country, we'll 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 have to understand uh, in terms of how we how we go about managing managing those. Um, then I think just on the project execution side, um, you know, again, I think it's been quite interesting over the last couple of months where. Uh, in the private space, we've seen these large volumes of procurement happening, uh, you know, either projects reaching financial close or in, in process of reaching financial close over the next uh, couple of months. Um, and obviously, we've we've got some of the previous bid window uh, projects also, you know, still in execution activity. So when you start looking at, at, at what's coming over the next, uh, over the next 24 months, where you've got, you know, two to three gigawatts of of wind projects in, in execution. And, uh, you know, these projects uh, often align in terms of the, the execution schedule. Um, you know, this introduces quite a lot of uh, interesting dynamics, which we've not had to deal with, uh, deal with in the past. Um, you know, because I think from, from the local market perspective is uh, once you have, you know, a limited number of ports that can deal with um, wind turbine components coming in, um, you know, we've got challenges in, in, in port congestion. Uh, we see challenges with, you know, the availability of storage uh, close to port. Um, we see challenges with uh, police escorts not being available in, in the large numbers that they are needed uh, to support, uh, you know, the evacuation of these uh, components from the ports uh, to sites. Um, and uh, you know, and again, that's linked to some of the outdated uh, guidelines that we have, like the TRH11 for abnormal loads. That's not really catered for, for our industry. Um, and then, you know, uh, the availability of, of large cranes remains quite a big challenge, right? So uh, the stop-start nature of, of our industry has, has not been not been beneficial, uh, you know, to, to, to the crane contracting market. We often have to import these cranes. From overseas, so it's you know uh, we all carry the the cost of doing you know the the mobilization and demobilization of these large cranes, and it introduces a whole lot of risk in execution if you have one of these cranes breaking down uh, during execution, and you know it could take a couple of weeks or months to find um, you know find find an additional crane. So I think those are some of the challenges we're seeing in execution, and I don't think any of any of these are are not solvable. Um, yeah. You know I think again visibility on on pipeline of, of, of projects and, and execution. I think more engagement uh, between all the various stakeholders as an industry. Uh, so whether it be the IPPs, uh, you know, key contractors, uh, window EMs, uh, you know, actually collaborating more, creating visibility of, of, of what's coming so that you can better manage that. 
uh, you know, better alignment and engagement with uh, with various government departments and specifically uh, for us, the Department of, of Transport um, and, and, and Ports Authorities. Uh, and again, open, openness from government to consider, you know, adapting or changing guidelines like PRH 11 for, for abnormal loads. So, um, yeah, so again, positivity and we're seeing procurement uh, happening, um, introducing new challenges, which uh, I think we just have to work together um, yeah. and find, uh, or find wise, ways to solve them. Yeah, thanks, Compton. Uh, and scale, and as you say, pipeline will help a lot, you know, when you get certainty. Exactly. So, Vaughan, the ne next one for you, um, you know, you spoke you spoke a lot about these these contractor challenges and, and you know, it's just the commercial aspects of, of construction and, uh, you know, guarantees, you know, whether you're on FIDEC or NEC or, or, or in any of those conditions of contract. But, you know, so how do you unlock it? How, how do you get better partnering between, uh, you know, ESKIM, the contractors, you know, the requirements, you know, in your view, you know, is, is there a better way uh, and, and a way from, from a South African perspective, we can better solve, you know, the conditions of contract because they are adversarial um, as you, as you rightfully pointed out. Thanks, Paul. I, I do, I do believe that there's, um, there's a move internationally um, which I think that that we might be perhaps lagging a bit behind, um, and for me the sad thing is that in you know in this we we at, in South Africa and certainly going back 15 20 years, I think that we were better at it then than we are now, and that is that um, the sense that this you know, partnering requires a, a relatively large degree of maturity. In, in in relations and managing relations and it's built up over a time and that I, in my experience has been a sort of a bridge too far for us and I think that certain of the contract forms are reflecting uh, a more realistically and um, um, attainable um, process and that is and it's you know it's, it's a it's perhaps an imprecise word but we see it in the, the, the most recent FIDIC form, the most recent NEC form, and we will also be seeing it to a degree in our local GCC conditions of contract, and that is towards a cooperation. And the cooperation is fostered through the agreement, through the, the terms of the contract itself. And this leads to contracts, construction contracts, seemingly becoming more project management tools than contracts in the strict sense of it. But I do believe that with, with a, a sense of cooperation that we're seeing, and I think Compton was mentioning it um, um, on, on, you know, just in terms of the practicalities of getting a turbine from A to B, I think if we focus on the, um, the, require, the ability that we have to cooperate, I think that that would go a lo uh, go a long way to um, to freeing up at least the commercial side of of contracting, and I think that without that being in place, and without that sense of cooperating, not only in terms of the contracting strategies, but the contracting implementation itself, yeah. and that cooperation being fostered through the terms of the contract, I think that we'll see some really good. Um, and substantial steps in in the direction that we need to be in, yeah. and it's not unattainable. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, Vaughan, uh, hundred percent right. I think we have fallen backwards. Uh, I agree with that comment. So before I I, I, I get James to sort of give a last uh, overall positive view, because James started off very positively. Bernard, just from from the IPP office point of view, what? What's your horizon over the next six months and nine months? Are you well capacitated? Are you ready to unlock everything that needs to get unlocked? <laughs> you know, are you, are you positive that uh, you know these re 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 programs can be can be rolled out? Well, I think we 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 from the IPP office are ready as it can be. Um, you saw the uh, bid window seven uh, storage and battery seven point six gigawatt that we released in December. Uh, and the plan is to close the RIP and battery storage now in April. And then by December, we want this project to reach financial close and then they move into construction for two years, over the next two years. 
Um, we also have 1.7 gigawatt of um, projects that are now in construction phase that we are monitoring to make sure that they, they reach their commercial operation. So five of those 14 projects will uh, reach commercial operation by the end of this year. Uh, and we also have another 1.3 gigawatt of PV from Bid Window 6 and um, Battery Storage 1 that are currently preparing for commercial close between March and, and June this year. So we are hard at work. And, and then in the, in the horizon, we also, um, in the near future, obviously, given the availability of the grid, we have another 1,000 megawatts of uh, gas dedicated for KUHA that we are now ready to issue the uh, RFQ. Uh, and then we've got bid window eight, another five gigawatt that uh, will follow very much the, the, the drafting on bid window seven, that's also imminent. And then we also have another battery storage, 616 megawatts that should be released in, in the next couple of months as well. So that, that's what we are looking at in the next um, uh, six months to a year. Uh, and obviously, and anything and everything that can be sent our way uh, will be released. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, thanks very much. And James, really, um, over to you. Do you believe we have the enabling environment? Do you, do you believe we've been improving? You know, you started off really positively, landing some positive messages here. We we obviously will uh, still have load shedding uh, in the foreseeable future. But, but you, are you seeing uh, private sector governments uh, and all the players having a closer collaboration here to, to make it happen? No, thanks, Paul. Maybe also just in reference to, I think, the points that Vaughan and Crompton have made about engagement and cooperation. Um, and, and again, goes to my earlier point, not to take away from, I think, the often lack of confidence and distrust in the overall system um, and the impact of, you know, Bernard's mentioned COVID, and load shedding has been, you know, from a societal perspective for small businesses has been absolutely debilitating. So it's very difficult to just come out and say, well, things are new and positive and things are all going to happen because it's not that easy. That said, um, I mean, even all the relaxations that Vaughan referred to in IG car, that was a direct result. Um, even the legal challenge on, on the on the bid windows or not on the bid windows on, uh, on the IG car when it came out, um, that was a direct result of very open engagement with the grid access unit, uh, some bold decisions made by the leadership there to go, well, we've got better information, we've engaged business, we've now got good banking developer input, um, and so let's make the adjustments. Uh, so I think that the responsiveness, the openness to engage, we've never seen a more engaging government, uh, ESKIM, uh, you know, so, so I think that that for me is a very positive thing we've got to build on. Um, Part of that, though, does come back to load shedding. Uh, and I think I, what I would like to just close off and say is that, you know, we've seen this historic downward trend of EAF roughly 3% year on year. Um, people like to look at the numbers, you know, so 22 was 58%, 58%, uh, 23, 54.7. If we continue on that trajectory of uh, sort of EAF or kind of ESKIM performance, there's nothing really that we could do. We can't build renewables and variable energy quick enough to compensate for that. We will be stuck with load shedding for a very long time. And I think that's also, again, comes through in the IRP. So to build trust, uh, to turn this thing around at a societal level to say we've got business confidence, investment confidence, and that we are going to be able to move forward, we do need to have an understanding that can we solve load shedding? Then can we mobilize investment? And is this investment in the interest of all South Africans? And I think there again, from a partnership perspective, you know, the, the president has personally championed this. He meets with, with business and all the ministers every six weeks in person. Now, that's quite unique uh, globally uh, to have that level of commitment of engagement. Um, I think that if we also look at uh, within uh, Nikon Workstream 1, the Eskom turnaround um, under Becky Kumalo, I think he's doing a marvelous job. I think Eskom are doing um, a really fantastic job. And, and, and again, we know where it's come from, a very low base, but they're really focusing on where the important issues and impacts that we can make technically. How do we also deal with procurement issues, people issues, et cetera? So they have a, a sort of a technical recovery program that should be able to bring back sort of two and a half gigs in 2024. Um, not all of that's going to happen. Um, and there are always other risks. 
But I think already from September last year, we've seen very much a flattening of that EAF um, upward trajectory in 2023. Um, I mean, my numbers tell me that sort of year on year from September till now, we are year on year doing better in 23 than we were in 22 um, on EAF performance. And all of the modeling that I referred to earlier have really kind of landed on a scenario that says, as long as EAF doesn't decline, and we keep on the investment programs, the reform programs, and we keep that collaboration engagement, we will be able to, from a societal perspective, end load shedding by the end of 2024. That puts us in a position where I think, you know, as Crompton has referenced, we've got to build those skills, build more innovation, agility, and we've really got to then step up on delivery. Um, but but we do need um, a capable state. We we need yeah. the IPP office. We need public big public auctions. We need ESKIM. We need NERSA. We need DMRE. We need to engage in the IRP. So I think sometimes we also have to kind of um, realize that we have to engage openly uh, in a positive way. It's not always going to be easy. We're not always going to get the the sort of the business or commercial output that we are specifically looking for. But I think there's been very well demonstrated. And even at the moment, um, we've got business teams sitting in the energy action kind of work groups over this three days, engaging on really important issues. Uh, ESKIM, IPP office, NERSA are there making concessions and saying, how do we get things done? So there is a sense of urgency and action. And, and I think we have to take that at face value and engage in that in a constructive way. But the opportunity is there. Thanks, Paul. No, thanks, James. 100%. And I'm glad you ended up that, you know, from my perspective, Security of supply is, is the number one issue, uh, and all parties have to act together to get this. This is not about, you know, a long-term strategy where we've got to do. We've got security of supply issues. We have to address those. We all have to work together to get it done. So to end off, I, I really want to thank uh, the panelists uh, and thank for your forthright answers, and, and thanks to the audience. Uh, I, we've been reading the questions. I, I think we have some of them are very specific, so, so obviously we didn't want to cover those, but I think... In general, we've given you um, uh, so, some some food for thought, uh, and I think we've covered some of those questions. Um, so I'd like to uh, again thank the panelists and, and hand over to Shannon. Thanks so much, Paul. That brings us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to say thank you to our facilitator, Paul O'Flaherty, for enabling a robust and engaging discussion on the important topic of South Africa's energy industry. Thank you also to our panelists, James Mackay from the Energy Council of South Africa, Vaughan Hutting from MDA Attorneys, Bernard Magoro from the IPP office, Compton Saunders from Nordex, and Mamiki Matlawa from Acton. We really appreciate you taking the time to join this panel. A big thank you to our sponsors, EY Parthenon, MDA Attorneys, Nordex, Actum, Sungro, and NG for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join this discussion on South Africa's energy outlook, where the panel unpacked what we can expect regarding ESCOM's restructuring, new generation investment, grid expansion, and strategies for local content. Our next webinar takes place on Wednesday, 28 February at 2 p.m. and focuses on ways to improve legacy planning and security in South African mining. The link to register for that webinar was shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course, and if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach me at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you so much for your time, and goodbye. <laughs>